Hello and let's talk about the FIRs that have been filed against journalists in Kashmir. The journalistic fraternity in Kashmir and the rest of the country were in for a shock over the past few days when the police in quick succession moved against three journalists on various charges. First, it was reported that Kashmiri photojournalist Masrat Zahra was booked under the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act UAPA for social media posts that allegedly glorify anti-national activities. Then we learned that an FIR was filed against Pizada Ashik, the Hindu's correspondent in Srinagar, for a report published on April 19th. Finally, yesterday, it was reported that veteran journalist Gauhar Gilani was booked for social media posts again that supposedly glorified terrorism in the Kashmir Valley. The targeting of journalists is not new either in Kashmir or in any other part of the country. However, the success of FIRs in this short time span, and that too during the time of the pandemic, and the nature of these charges, has left many concerned on the impact it will have on journalists' freedom to operate in the region. This freedom, of course, has faced and is facing considerable restrictions after the August 2019 decision to abrogate the autonomy of Jammu and Kashmir and bifurcate the state. To discuss all these issues and more, we talked to Anis Zargar, our correspondent in Srinagar. Here is what he had to say. Thank you so much, Anis, for talking to us. So we understand that FIRs have been filed against three journalists in the past couple of days. And uh, we also, uh, we've been covering how obviously over the past many months, the situation has not been very good for journalists. There's been a lot of restrictions on their work. But could you talk a bit about the context specifically over the past uh, one week where this targeting has taken place on these journeys? Uh, actually, uh, it started with uh, Masrat. He's a, she's a photojournalist uh, uh, who, has, who has worked with different uh, national organizations. Uh, her work has been published in Getty Images and uh, other international uh, outlets, and uh, she has been reporting for, for four years now. Uh, it, she had re, uh, reposted one of her old uh, uh, pile photographs and uh, given a caption out of it. And so uh, she was summoned by the cyber police, which has lately been very active over the past uh, week or two. So they have been calling up people uh, who share any uh, you know, controversial posts on social media. So this time they called Masrat, uh, and while uh, she was she was approached by different uh, journalists, uh, and she was told not to go. That they have, uh, and the press club body, uh, well, she was told that they have sorted out the issue, and there is no need uh, to go to the police station because this is not the first time that uh, journalists in Kashmir are being summoned. This has actually started with the uh, abrogation of Article 317 in August last year. Uh, since then, uh, a lot of reporters, uh, national working with national dailies, local dailies, have been summoned up by police. You know, uh, uh, occasionally, uh, some of them for doing stories, while, and some of them were called to reveal their sources while they, all they got their information uh, while covering the ground report from Kashmir. So uh, this time, uh, what has happened? This is really unprecedented. It's, it's for the first time that three journalists have been, you know. Uh, uh, slapped with FIR back to back in just two days. Uh, the Archik was uh, not, uh, you know, booked on for a social media post. He was t- booked for a story that he did uh, on a on a Shupian, uh, uh, in a, on an encounter in Shupian, and his fam- the family members of the slain militants had told him something which he reported, and the government has actually, you know, authorities have actually gone used him against used against used it against him. Similarly, when we uh, uh, last night we got to know about another colleague of ours, that uh, Gauhar Gilani, who has been uh, who has been working in Kashmir for the last two decades, uh, along with Peter Dashik, uh, both of them have uh, you know worked. Uh, they're very experienced journalists, and he has been uh, you know uh, give, he has been booked for on charges of you know uh, questioning the integrity of the nation, and and his posts have been you know deemed unlawful. And as as prejudicial uh, and prejudicial to the national integrity, sovereignty, and security of the country, uh, which uh, which which is very you know vague and uh, in his own words frivolous and uh, concocted. So uh, uh, the key another key aspect also is that this is taking place while the COVID nineteen pandemic is of course affecting the affecting Kashmir, the Kashmiri society also in a spe- in an extremely accentuated manner because of the restrictions. So how does this? Uh, how do we see these cases at a time when there has been reporting against the failures of the state in providing for the people of Kashmir during the pandemic? Yeah, the timing of the you know what makes it more upsetting is the timing of these uh, charges against these journalists. 
Pizda Ashik for is uh, somebody who recently broke a story that 5000 uh, kits you know testing kits have been diverted to uh, from Srinagar to Jammu and the government next day you know issued a rep- rebuttal calling Pizda Ashik story as uh, a fake news uh, that is one another aspect of that they are they are accusing the journalist of you know peddling fake news which is not the case uh in masrat's case also uh when she had posted a photograph of of uh, of a protest in kashmir, kashmir from two years back she, it was said that the police official had said that uh, it was it was a fake news um uh, which which was not the case the protest had actually happened now they uh, used the timing against uh, the journalist to this and said that it is it has not happened now and it had happened two years back, uh, before which which makes it a fake news and they're coming up with a whole lot of these arguments and you know these uh, uh, t- trying to tweak uh, around uh, these charges so that so that they they stick in in the in the framework of fake news and uh, pizza ashik you know uh, again his story was uh, you know clubbed in uh, in the uh, in the framework of fake news which was not the case and uh, uh, also uh, what makes it more difficult is that the, the response uh, is not is not uh, you know gathering up because of the situation uh, there is there is, there is an outbreak there is a lockdown uh, and the government has actually, the authorities including the police uh, they have been you know very uh, uh, they have used excessive force uh, trying to enforce this lockdown in 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 the valley and at the same time they have people have accused the authorities of being you know using brute force against people who are out uh, to even buy essential uh, food items there are doctors who have accused the authorities of uh, using force against them there are these people who are working with the smc municipality of the region there are there are even journalists who have uh, accused the authorities of uh, using force against them not them not uh, uh, helping not uh, letting them to do their job and th- these are the stories which were coming out from the ground and uh, these journalists and others also were you know uh, in fact uh, uh, reporting it and the timing uh, at this point of time is also being questioned in that framework that it is something it is do- being done when the journalists are critical of the administration critical of the government for questioning them that their response is not adequate to deal with the situation to deal with the covid-19 in the region right and as you pointed out a key issue here is the very vagueness of the charges because when you say social media posts are being used to glorify terrorism it uh, the it's almost an astounding amount of vagueness in what it means so in this context also what are the uh, say journalist organizations in kashmir how are they mobilizing and responding to this uh, you know there was a statement earlier by the kashmir press club body of which gavhar gilani is also a part when when the statement came and they came out with a statement uh, there was not an affair against him uh, they had actually condemned the whole uh, charges uh, leveled against both these dashik and uh, masrat uh, then they also went in to meet uh, the authorities uh, uh, they have there has been a social media campaign going on uh, on both twitter and facebook and through whatsapp groups also uh, that is the kind of response that we are seeing right now uh, and a lot of uh, rights bodies have actually also condemned the authorities uh, these fresh charges against journalists in kashmir including the amnesty international and women's network in uh, of uh, journalists uh, in the country and and also there are uh, uh, there are some politicians also the political parties from uh, the nc the pdp and the congress they have also condemned these fresh charges calling it a frivolous calling it frivolous and also they have actually questioned the whole uh, idea of uapa how it has been misused against how it can be used as a uh, misused against people right. and um, most of the campaign right now is happening uh, online because of the situation uh, you know because of the challenges uh, of this outbreak right now people mm-hmm. cannot uh, you know call for action they cannot go for protest they cannot hold a rally they cannot hold any sit in right now uh, because the entire area is locked down and uh, people have also have to maintain social distancing at this point of time right. yeah prashant thank you so much anish for talking to us All right, thank you. Our next segment is about medicines and patents amid the raging COVID-19 pandemic. How does the existing intellectual property rights regime affect the availability and prescription of medicines during this period? News Clicks Prabir Purkaisa talks to us on this issue. What are the key medicines that are yeah, what do you call options right now 
And how does the patent regime basically affect the use of them and what are the options governments have? You see, if we look at what, what would be called the most advanced ones which are being used, and these are repurposed medicines, that means these medicines already exist, existed for other diseases, are now being thought of, may have value also against the COVID-19 disease itself. Now, this, this among these, apart from hydrochloroquine, all of these which are going under trials seem to be patented medicine, which means they're under patent protection. If it's patent protected, that means the generic version is really not available, okay? Because it's still under patent and patents are protected under different regimes, different countries, but the TRIPS agreement has forced everybody to give patents and what are called product patents. So given that these medicines are not available, only hydrochloroquine, chloroquine, these are the probably the only medicines which are being talked of, as well as azithromycin. These are the two medicines, if you remember, were used in the French trials, that these are not under, uh, at the moment, patent protection. Generic versions are available. If we look at the one drug which seems to be perhaps the most uh, touted at the moment is Gilead Sciences Remdesivir, which was originally developed against Ebola, did not work. Now people are saying that it seems to be also useful and it could be very useful against COVID-19. It's under the solidarity WHO trials. The interesting part is all those who have been very critical of the French trial because it didn't use double-blind trials, et cetera, et cetera. It used it in essentially serious patients. They don't seem to have the same criticism of the Gilead science trials currently, which of course are also being conducted under very similar conditions. Not the WHO trials, but the trials which have been reported. And I don't see similar kinds of criticism coming out of that. And, and Gilead Sciences stock has actually risen because WHO has also said that this drug seems to be effective against the virus. Now, how and why these are effective against the viruses, I'll, I'll leave that out completely because we don't really know much about that till widespread trials are con conducted. We really will not be able to figure out what the pathways are, how it works, and to the extent it does. But all of these, the other ones which are there, are the, anti the antivirals. Now, all the antivirals, uh, and most of them are essentially complex molecules, they are protected today under patents as well. And even the WHO trials, all of them are uh, the, the, the antiretrovirals they're using in the solidarity trials, all of them again have essentially patent, made, patented medicines, the Ritonvar, Lopinvar uh, combination. We also are talking about adding uh, certain other things in it, which are anti-flu kind of stuff. So interferon uh, alpha, so and I think interferon beta is being used in the trials. So all of these actually are also under patent protection. So what is it that we can do on these issues? Well, we have one instrument which still remains, even after trips, which is what's called compulsory licensing. Under compulsory licensing, if particularly there is a pandemic, you can actually license, force the license, give it to other companies and say manufacture, and the government can decide what is the amount of license fees that could be given to the original patent holder. So this is, I think, the immediate course of action to take. Let's also be clear, our kitty against viruses have not been that useful because most of the times they're expensive biologic drugs, they're complex molecules, and they have all, they're currently it's very, not many of such drugs exist, even against other viruses. Even if you take anti-AIDS drugs, as you can see, it doesn't clear the body of the AIDS disease, but it continues that you have to take it for, for your life. You know? So those are the kind of things we still have with the virus. So what you do with this medicine is allow the body to build up antibodies which can fight and defeat the virus. So that is the medical issue at the moment. So I think, yes, the, this, this it could lead to, again, fleecing the global population, mm -hmm. making money out of the disease. As the economy sinks, that Gilead stock should rise itself tells you what are the issues involved. Right. Will the poor of the world get the medicines? Yes. If the governments come together, yes. If you can 
compulsorily license these drugs, and that's a demand that should be raised globally. If whatever drugs are useful against COVID-19, compulsorily license them, but do not make it, give it under patent protection. And this is, the, is something that I think the global community has to raise as an issue. That's all we have in this episode of Let's Talk. We'll be back tomorrow with the latest news developments of the day. Until then, keep watching NewsClick. Thank <laughs> you.